from one another. As you can see here, the theme that we're going to um, focus on today is applying a social justice framework to curriculum. And I chose this image because it reminded me of The Gardener's Tale, which if you hadn't, haven't seen it, um, it's a really great, um, I think that Kamara Jones does a really great job of, of telling it. And that's the link there, um, which Courtney will also post in the chat box. And because of that, when I think about curriculum, I think about this image and we, I think how we don't want our curriculum or our school climates for that matter um, to look like this. We don't want this soil devoid of nutrients um, so that only, um, you know, a dandelion can survive and thrive. Um, and I, I sort of think of that dandelion as Obama. Um, and we don't, we don't want that. We don't want only um, the dandelions to be able to make it. Although sometimes dandelions are really great. <laughs> uh, we just want more than that um, for our students and for our schools and for the future of midwifery. So onto the next slide. I just have to do this for <laughs> midwives and midwifery educators because you can't show your birth photos to everyone. So that's me <laughs> and my two kiddos. Um, and an example of me teaching when we take the students down to Olympia for educating our legislators as well. I took both my kids when they were about six months old. So that's me. Um, I've been a midwifery educator for basically as long as I've been a midwife um, for the last uh, nine years. So here you get to see the Padlet site. Um, Courtney's gonna post the link for you. And basically what you see here is all of the content that I'll be referring to today. So you have this link and you can go there and you can download any of these items. Some of these are repeat things from the Equity and Midwifery Education website as well. Um, but you can, um, as I said, you can download any of this content from there. Here, um, we have an example of a, an equity statement from a midwifery education program, Ryerson University in Canada. There are other examples that you can see linked from the link at the bottom here that Courtney will post in the chat box. Um, because, and I put, put this here because I think equity and social justice policies and statements are one place, I don't want to say where you can start because it's, it's not something that you can do without any information and without good input. But it is, a, it is one of the places where you can start as an institution if you don't have already um, an equity or social justice um, policy and statement. It can help you set your priorities for your institution. And of course, to be able to create such a statement, you probably need to be able to have faculty and staff training if you don't. Um, already and so there's more information um, and a link to that as well and of course whenever you do create um, policies and statements if they're just words then they're not um, going to get you where you want to be um, so you also have to figure out how you're going to meet your goals um, but of course as we all know it certainly helps to have goals and so this is one example um, and um, the midwifery education program at Ryerson um, as they state here, um, sees its role in education and in the midwifery profession as part of a broader commitment to social justice. And um, you can read more um, at the source if you're interested. I'm gonna pass through things um, a little quickly today because I really want to get to the interactive portion of our call today. Um, but as I said, everything, all of these resources are available for you to dig into more depth. Um, we could talk about any number of these things probably for a very long time. So. Um, we'll start today with just a few definitions, a little bit of time on definitions. Um, and the first definition we're going to work with is social justice. And I also, um, since we are educators, I want to demonstrate for you um, a tool for educators that you can use, whether you teach at a brick and mortar school, um, a hybrid program, or an online program, you can use this tool. It's really cool. I don't know how many of you have ever used it before. You can feel free to stay in the chat box. Um, but let's everybody, if you can, um, get out your phone or if you're adept at doing two things on your computer at once <laughs> and um, try to do what it says here on the bottom text my part of my name there Kristen Efla <laughs> 874 so that 
that's what you put in the in the text and the number that you text to is 37607. You can also use the link, um, the, the pollev.com link. Um, and what this is, is it's a, it's a poll that you can all participate in. Um, and I'm gonna give you a minute to all kind of get hooked up with that because it, it takes a minute for everybody to get to try to do that. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. I can try to help you um, understand. But basically, we're gonna, I'm going to have you submit a definition for social justice once you get hooked into this Poll Everywhere system. So, um, and as a tool, um, this is a really great tool. You could use it in every class if you wanted to. But it's an especially great tool when you're talking about difficult subjects with your students, or if you want to give them a way to provide anonymous information um, in a kind of real time way. So let me go ahead out and see if we have got some of you hooked into this yet. Has anyone tried to respond? Um, can, um, if, you're, if you've got it all set up, can you please go ahead someone and try to give us a definition for social justice? We want to try to define social justice. I'm guessing that you're kind of trying to get it set up again. You're going to, um, the number that you text to is 37607. And the first text that you send is the Kristen Efla 874 to kind of get hooked into the poll. And then from there, you can text a response. Um, and again, if you prefer, you can do it at the pollev.com link there. Anyone have any questions or anything while you're trying to get that going? You might hear my little baby crying in the background. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hopefully she'll fall asleep soon. She's with our babysitter, actually a midwifery student. They make great babysitters <laughs> in my <laughs> experience. Oh, here we've got one. Okay, good. So as you can see coming up here on the screen, um, we're getting some definitions for social justice. So here we have social justice. It's about equity and access as well as about rectifying historical and current injustices, especially around race and racial inequality. It involves, um, social justice in health involves oppression, privilege, social and structural determinants of health. For a definition of social justice, all citizens are equal and have equal worth. Any other definitions we can get from you? Oh, here we go, good. Fair and just distribution of opportunities, wealth and ability to survive and thrive. Equal and equitable access to resources for all. Keep them coming if you're willing, if you've got it situated. I, it always takes a little while to get this going, but I think it's such a great tool for educators. I um, wanted to loop you into it. It's a free tool for up to 40 responses per poll. So it's a great tool. Um, and you can do different kinds of things. It doesn't have to be um, just short answer. It, you can do multiple choice, um, all kinds of things. We've got another one here. Society has no structural barriers to health and well-being. Anyone else want to try to send it in? I know some of you might not be that fast of texters, so <laughs> that could be. Um, you might be trying to type something long. And again, the nice thing is anonymous. We don't know who's saying what. You can do just, um, if you send in short words, um, it, it does a cool thing where it makes it bigger. If six people say the same answer, it'll kind of get bigger on the screen. We have another one here in midway free education social justice must be interweaved into curriculum faculty development staff policies procedures resources for access and success um, it's at the heart of a representative midwifery workforce you all are so smart <laughs> social justice also exposes under told or suppressed histories exposing embedded inequity and how it has affected now equity is not equality this is great you all are awesome so I'm so excited to be interacting with you um, today and for us to share ideas and um, resources. Um, we can pop back to this in a minute, but let's go ahead and just move forward um, since it seems like a lot of you have gotten the idea here. 
um, for this resource and how you might use it in your classrooms. And I'll go ahead, oops, let me just hit present here. And you'll see that um, your definition of social justice, I think is a good one. And um, the one here comes from these authors who are, this is a great resource, this book, Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice. Um, and um, you know they have their definition here. A vision of society, we've got distribution of resources is equitable. equitable. All members are physically and psychologically safe and secure. Social justice involves social actors who have a sense of their own agency, as well as a sense of social responsibility toward and with others and the society as a whole. So there you go. Um, and there are, um, yeah, sorry, let me move on to the next. It, for some examples of resources related to social justice and midwifery, um, you can check out this web page. Um, and I welcome any additional resources that you think belong on this web page. You can send them to me um, anytime. And I'm just going to move right through this because you do have access to these slides um, and to this, these websites um, from the Padlet tool and um, through the um, internets. <laughs> so uh, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on definitions, but um, for equity, um, you can't talk about social justice without talking about equity. So here we have that guarantee of fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement. We want to identify and eliminate barriers. Um, so um, this definition comes from the resource at the bottom there, but also on the right you're seeing I'm popping up. Um, there's a glossary of terms and a note about language that you can find um, on, web, on the website linked here, as well as um, on the Padlet site. So if you want to spend more time thinking about this, and I recommend we all do, um, there's another resource for you. As for theory, um, when we're talking about social justice education, I've got a definition here for you. Um, and again, with pedagogy, we're just talking about how we teach, um, how we approach teaching. Um, and so um, all of you do some of these things, if not all of them already. Um, and um, this is a way, this call is a way for us to think about how can we do it even better. Um, we want to um, have a pedagogy, ideally, I think, <laughs> that is experiential, participant-centered, inclusive, collaborative, and democratic, that acknowledges the reproduction of systemic inequalities of advantage and disadvantage in group processes. And that's likely where all of us can continue to do better. Um, and it, again, we've got those resources on the Padlet site as well as online for you. Um, basically, a bunch of excerpts about what is social justice education. Um, tiny bit more theory for you, just some equity pedagogy here. Um, and equity pedagogy places the student at the center. Um, and we want to help them become effective agents for social change if we want to use an equity pedagogy. And again, you can read more about that and why I think um, especially when you read um, about helping students gain the content, attitude, and skills needed to know reflectively, to care deeply, and to act thoughtfully. The ways in which an equity pedagogy is, I think, inexorably connected to uh, the midwifery model of care. And you can read more about that as well um, in the resource, resources that I've provided for you. Just a quick note, um, I think you all know this, but we can't talk about it enough. Why? We want to focus on equity and social justice, um, and um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is a conceptual model that um, I borrowed from a different source um, and adapted a little with permission. Um, and this figure is um, not only available for you to see here in these slides, but um, I just got word last night that it's published. Um, my chair, Karen Hayes, and I. <laughs> um, in the journal midwifery um, coming out. It comes out in June, but it's available now um, for you to look at for the next 50 days for free. So go ahead if you'd like and check out um, our article, a web-based resource for promoting equity and midwifery education and training towards meaningful diversity and inclusion. Because obviously in the end, we want to achieve health equity and we want to increase workforce diversity. Um, and um, we need work to get there. So there you go. All right, so one of the other resources I want to introduce you to today is some curriculum checklists. 
and we um, we could spend a bunch of time <laughs> just on those. Um, we're not going to specifically go through a checklist today. None of the ones that I have linked for you are perfect, but I think that they all can get your juices flowing. And then there's two that are pretty decent. Um, and I, I put the ones that I think are better at the top. And they're all linked again from that Padlet site as well as from um, the curriculum uh, webpage um, that you see here and that Courtney's posting in the chat box. Um, and I think when you're reviewing your syllabus before your quarter, your trimester, your semester starts, um, this is one way to get your juices flowing and to help improve your syllabus um, to make it more what you want it to be um, in terms of promoting equity um, and social justice and applying that social justice framework um, to your curriculum. I also like um, the reading about the syllabus statements that have been created by other people. I haven't yet had a chance to develop my own perfect syllabus statement, but I hope to do that <laughs> um, soon, um, maybe before the next quarter starts here. Um, and um, if you'd like some ideas of syllabus statements that you could include in your own syllabus, um, Brown University has this resource here as well. So um, we're going to move into the interactive set part really quick here, but before we do that, um, I wanted to just give um, a little di disclaimer and a note regarding my own positionality. positionality. Um, I will be teaching and facilitating this work from my perspective as a white faculty member. There's a lot I still don't know, so please feel free to point out anything that you notice. You can do that publicly, I'm comfortable with that, and also privately. Um, and um, I also want to note in advance that I will be discussing and encouraging others of you on this call to discuss examples of things you have learned about how to be more sensitive, inclusive, and equitable in your classroom, on your um, online learning platforms if you use them, and in your syllabi. Um, I want to acknowledge that what constitutes aha moments for us as white folks, if you are a white folk or <laughs> I am, um, can be experienced as painful sometimes for people of color um, because sometimes what is an aha for um, like myself, a white person, um, it's hard to hear that sometimes from a different position. Um, and um, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, but it's also important for us to talk about so that we can do better. Um, and, and secondly, I just want to acknowledge um, the program and faculty, the maternal child health systems program where I got my master's last year at Bastyr University because I learned and continue to learn so much from, um, from that, from that program and from the amazing um, faculty there. And um, I just, much of what I will share with you comes in part from that, so. All right, let's, um, oh, and there, there is a little picture. Uh, we're gonna try to, give you some tools and share tools and ideas today. So hopefully um, we can um, not have our, you know, um, desert <laughs> wasteland soil there um, and so that we can hopefully do better. All right, so here we are onto our potential areas for improvement. And this is really where um, I wanna hear from all of you. Um, I have some things I can share but the, the goal would be for us to share with each other things we have learned, um, what um, <laughs> things we wish we did different, things we're hoping to do, you know, basically um, just uh, trying to share with one another. And again, don't be afraid to ask us to turn off the recording if you have something that you don't necessarily want to be in a recording, um, because I wouldn't want you to censor yourself. Um, also, the poll that you did earlier with the definition for social justice, you can still, I'm gonna just show that again quickly here. Um, you can still use that today. Um, so um, same thing, you can still text in and it'll come. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and clear these off so that we can have new stuff come in. Courtney and I will be watching, um, probably Courtney more than me if I'm talking, <laughs> um, this poll everywhere site um, so that you can, you can say things in here and be anonymous but have them contributed to our forum here today, uh, our call. Um, you can also type in the chat box, although that won't be anonymous. Um, and you can unmute yourself at any time. Don't be afraid to do that um, if you're wanting to talk and contribute and share. 
if your dog's barking really loud, maybe, you know, <laughs> take a break and come back to you, that kind of thing. But otherwise, um, I am just looking really forward to hearing from all of you. The first area, so I basically these potential areas for improvement, there are tons more, <laughs> um, I'm sure, and I welcome those ideas from you. Um, these are just what I came up with basically, spending some time with those curriculum checklists. These are things I came up with as potential areas for improvement when we're thinking about revising our curriculums, curricula, <laughs> um, and um, revising our syllabi. What, what kind of areas can we focus on? So um, we're going to go through them all today. Um, but if you have one that we're not exactly talking about right in the moment and you really want to share it, um, don't be afraid to do that. Um, so let's, let's do the first one. One area, um, potential area for improvement, is terminology and language. Um, does anybody want to give an example of something maybe you do or you learned at some point? Oh, and I'll give, I'll start to give you an idea. So with regard to terminology and language, um, when I'm speaking with students, um, oh, you can bring her here. That's my baby. <laughs> She's seven months. Um, the, an example of something that I had to learn um, from a, um, unfortunately, from a person of color. I used to work for a national organization. We were working to end discrimination and violence caused by gender stereotypes um, and um, in DC. And we, we really, as an organization, wanted to start hiring. We wanted to be more diverse, uh, you know, that process that organizations go th and institutions go through. And so we started hiring um, more people to have a more diverse workforce. Of course, none of those people, of course, say, of course, it shouldn't be this way, but it was, were at the top of the organization. Um, nonetheless, um, I hope that we at least did the best we could in the moment with what we could. Um, but unfortunately, we made a lot of mistakes. And one of them was that one of my colleagues, um, she said, you know, you really need to stop saying powwow. Because we would, you know, when we wanted to have a meeting, um, we would say, oh, let's have a powwow. And um, for multiple reasons, um, that was not okay. And I'm so grateful to her that she was willing to share that with us and to ask us to stop using that, um, you know, inappropriately using um, that language in a setting in which we were not at all having a powwow. Um, none of us were Native American. Um, and so I've tried to carry that forward anytime I hear anyone use that language in a setting in which it's inappropriate, which is any setting that I am in. Um, I, um, so anyway, that's my example. And I welcome, I'd love for anyone else to share. I see we have something in the chat box, but um, if anyone wants to unmute yourself and talk about some terminology or language, what, what could we do with that? Cynthia, do you want to say what you typed or we can also read it? Hi, um, I just um, recently learned that the word Caucasian is steeped in racist history and implies um, a false idea that race is by a lot. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. It's really important for us to just share those things with one another, right? Yeah, I was so grateful that somebody brought it to my attention. Yeah, I'm always really grateful when something, someone brings something to my attention too. Um, and um, it is important to be really grateful because sometimes it's really hard for someone to say those things. Um, or even if it's not exactly hard in the moment, it's hard because they have to do it a thousand times in their lifetime. Um, and that's why it's really great when we can you know, do our own education as well. Any other ideas that anyone else want to give an example of a terminology or language that you have changed, want to change in your, your work as an educator, um, in your syllabi? And Hi. Oh, go ahead. And say your name, please, if you're willing. Um, my name's Emily, and I am currently trying to uh, eliminate my uses of binary systems of gender and gender identity, such as she, him. Um, and I think within the maternal health world, we tend to 
get into the system of using gender binaries. So that's something I'm trying to change. Thanks for sharing, Emily. I, um, it's, and for many of us, that can be really difficult and it's emotionally charged and it's probably something we'll, we'll um, talk about more on a different call or webinar, but it is very important. Um, it's something we could talk about in much more depth. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, someone is asking, do we have a source for this? Oh, yeah, I got you. You guys got, you got a little chat going. There you go. <laughs> Anyone else want to share an example of something in this um, topic area? Um, this is Cynthia again. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, this is not related to uh, directly to race, but um, a big topic that's come up in our university is um, the use of person-first language in regard um, to diseases and how really critical that is to avoid um, othering and stigmatizing. And the, um, the main example has been around um, use of uh, language in diabetes. Um, you know, like not, so someone is not a diabetic, they are a person living with diabetes. Um, and um, also with obesity. And there's actually a really great article about that, um, that just came out that I could um, share in the chat box if people are interested. That would be great. Thank you so much. And I can include it. Um, you know, when I send out an email as a follow up to the call, you're reminding me in school, I remember learning that in genetics um, about, you know, when you're speaking about a baby um, or a child with Down syndrome, for example. Um, so it's a very good one. I'm really glad you're reminding me of that. Um, I also just recently um, heard of a way better way. I always struggled as a clinician and then thinking about how to teach students about it as well. Um, when we know that certain persons have increased risk for things like diabetes or obesity, but whenever I would try to talk at, you know, whenever I would try to educate a client, I would feel, it would feel yucky to just tell someone like, you're screwed, basically. You're not, I mean, that's not what I would say, but I think that's sometimes how people took it that um, you know, you're at increased risk for this. And they found it hard to hear. And um, just this week, actually, we had a speaker um, in, who really helped me to think about it differently. She, um, was, you know, she works with the Suquamish tribe here in Washington, and um, she's a, nutri a white nutrition educator. And um, she just did such a great job. I actually am going to go back and watch the recording and write down exactly what she said in practice, trying to say it how she said it. Um, but just, you know, explaining, but rather than just saying to an, you know, a Native, Amer Native American person, for example, you have an increased risk for um, diabetes. Um, before even talking about that, explaining why that probably is, um, that it comes from, um, you know, likely that, you know, basically there was a traditional diet high in omega fatty acids and um, berries, but with no refined flour or sugar. Um, and then when, you know, the colonizers came in and moved Native Americans onto reservations and took, you know, that whole process um, took away their light, their livelihood and their way of living. And then, um, you know, gave them a bunch of commodified foods, you know, like flour and sugar um, th that we created um, these problems that we see. And anyway, so I'm not saying it like she did, um, but um, just help so that it becomes not um, disempowering. It's really disempowering to just explain to someone, you have an increased risk for this because of something you can't control. Any other examples on this topic? Um, there's some stuff coming into the chat. Anyone else want to say anything out loud before? And obviously there's lots more that we could do, but um, we have lots of other topics we can move to as well. Thanks, good stuff in the chat here. Someone's saying calling the kettle black is a term not to use. 
Um, Courtney, I don't know if there's anything you want to add from the chat or from the poll everywhere before we move to the next topic. Sure, we don't have anything from the poll everywhere. Uh, we have an excellent comment here by Karen, who says two other Native American related phrases used a lot in white culture that I've been made aware of are low man on the totem pole and pioneer. The totem pole comment is inappropriate for use by those who are not from a culture in which totem poles are used. In the latter word, pioneer has historically negative consequences for Native peoples. White culture use it, uses it as a word of praise and admiration. So that was a very nice addition from Karen. And then Cheryl gives us all a, a lovely little reminder to keep notes by our desk, asking ourselves continuously the question, am I centering whiteness, gender, or heterosexualism in this material? So those were some great contributions I wanted to pull out here. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, and just before we quick move on, I will say that you are welcome to use what I've come up with here. I'm not saying it's perfect, but in terms of gender inclusive language, this is something I have added to my syllabi. Um, and so you're welcome to use it. That all of this besides the slides um, is in a handout that you can uh, download from the Padlet site as well. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. There's always more we could do in every topic. Oops. I'm giving you all the answers. <laughs> Let's, any, um, so one of the things that we can do and, um, that I've heard from you know, students of color who I have taught that they really felt like they weren't, and this was hopefully years ago, hopefully we're doing a little better now, but there's definitely way more we can always be doing. Um, they, you know, they didn't feel like they were visible in the curriculum, like they were, that, that they didn't feel like it, it totally represented them. So one strategy I, I think about for um, working on that is emphasizing community connections. Um, and um, this is just a, a small list of things. Um, these were organizations or resources that I didn't know about and I was never mentioning. Um, so you might think about how you can incorporate some of these into your learning activities. Um, how can you allow students to draw in the people and the organizations doing this work um, it, with their projects that they're doing in your classes. Um, does anyone have it? The really brand new one, you can even see it's like a blue bullet because I added it last night, is the National Black Midwives Alliance. I mean, they are just hot off the press. So very exciting. Um, any, any other thing that anyone wants to add in this se section? Um, for how we might emphasize community connections and help people feel more connected to their own communities when they're doing their schoolwork and learning to become a midwife. Yeah. Um, and again, this could just be more resources than anything else. But yes, if you are wanting to be, you know, just learning more, you can just spend time with these websites on your own um, as well and allowing students to spend some time on those websites. Um, the ACNM has a Midwives of Color Committee. Thanks, Tori. That's a great reminder. Um, I, um, this slide is getting very full, but if I could put it in right now, I would. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to write it on my notes and hopefully uh, add them for a future. Thank you. And I think another really important piece to this that we can add in is not only, like you said, Kristen, using these as resources, uh, but also emphasizing how we can get students to take active engagement and emphasizing community connections through different assignments, as well as allowing them to find and name and tell us about local organizations they may be involved in that we don't even know about to add to this list and to emphasize not only our national ones, but also our local ones that are often grassroots and community based. Very good. Thank you, Courtney. And I'm noticing someone in the um, chat is um, asking about LGBTQ groups. And that is um, obviously something we want to take into account as well. Um, I think the only thing I have up here specifically um, is birth for everybody um, as one resource, but you're absolutely right. There are um, 
some, re some LGBTQ resources on my website. On most pages, I hope. If you have more that you think belong um, on my website in various places, I really welcome you to send those to me. Um, I, because my initial work on the website was um, primarily around racial equity, I can take her, um, Jamie. Um, I really um, didn't, unfortunately, have time to do all of the things that we should be doing when we're thinking about equity. Um, and But obviously, people have intersecting identities, and so we definitely have to pay attention to the um, people who are from um, LGBTQ um, communities. So thank you for saying that. Thanks, um, thanks, Aaron. Um, some queer Facebook groups, Queer Mama, and others. Um, there's definitely a lot of um, a lot of resources about health um, related to LGBTQ um, persons. So thank you for that. I, um, I appreciate that. Anything else before we move to and religious minorities or something that I don't really address here at all. <laughs> um, so much more we could do. For um, the next area, just focusing on strength and resilience, not just disparities. Um, because focus really matters. Um, does anyone have anything you might like to share about this? Maybe a mistake you made <laughs> that you want to share or something you learned or um, anything of, in this topic area? So I'll share what I have here. Um, there are some strength-based interventions um, that um, you know, uh, on, in this section of the, my website um, that you can check out. Um, someone in the chat is saying, yeah, just learning more about this. I, I feel like it's relatively new for me as well, right? We, we learn that we need to focus on the disparities and we have to try to do everything we can to be thinking about them and making them better, hopefully, and eliminating them. Um, but if we always just talk about disparities, then we're really missing something. Um, and I remember when I was in college and just learning much more about feminism and um, women, I, you know, coming into my identity first as a woman and then later as genderqueer and, um, uh, and just, I remember thinking, why did, why have women allowed men, you know, this was my brain a long time ago why have women allowed men to oppress us for so long right um and that's be, that's what can happen i think when you only talk about disparities you can have um people from marginalized groups wondering you know that internalized sexism racism homophobia etc um we we have to help people see the ways in which they're resilient and that they have strength and um and they wouldn't be where they are without that resilience. So highlighting the work of midwives of color is one way, absolutely, to help people be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to bring anything up or verbally here in this section? Cheryl, do you want to share or we can leave it in the chat if that's preferable to you? Oh, Cheryl doesn't have audio. Oh, bummer. Okay. Um, I can probably read it or Courtney, I don't know if you want to. Sure, I'll read it really quick. So Cheryl shares that a resource, which is a book that she's appreciated by Zaretta Hammond, is entitled Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, Promoting Authentic Engagement and Rigor Among Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students. And uh, she says it focuses, you know, a lot of the material on K through 12, brick and mortar schools, but overall the content is very valuable. So that's a, a resource here in the chat box. And then we have a few other comments uh, from Emily as well. I don't know if Emily, you want to unmute yourself and, and talk to us a little bit more. Hi, um, this is Emily. Um, I think mostly just the comment is talking about how 
I think a lot of the times as um, white medical professionals or providers, we fall into a trap of the white savior complex, which entails focusing a lot on disparities, but not the strength and resilience of communities. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that becomes pretty problematic. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing, Emily. I think you're right. <laughs> if I get to say this right, I think you're right. <laughs> Good. Well, there's lots more we could do on this, and um, it sounds like an area where um, maybe even a topic for the future, because um, I think it's a hard one for some of us to make sure that we're doing all the time. Uh, I think I'll go to the next section unless, um, oh, did you wanna, anyone else? I don't wanna interrupt. There's a couple more chat box comments if either uh, Karen or Tori want to speak to those. Otherwise, we can leave them there as we continue on. Okay. Well, maybe we'll just move on for now, but obviously there's always more to be done. Um, the next area is just reconsidering the content, the questions we ask when we're asking students to, you know, respond to questions. Um, does anybody have an example of something here? Um, I'll just, maybe I'll share mine because maybe it's a little too esoteric without an example. It's really long. <laughs> but basically, I teach a health care policy and health systems course, and um, it, this fits really well there, but I kind of started to think that you can do it all the time, all the time when you're thinking about preeclampsia, et cetera. Um, and you can provide reading resources that go along with it. You can ask students to delve into it. Um, but basically, here's a really long way of giving students choice around this issue, but, but bringing up the topic. Um, and so you're welcome to use this language as well if you like it. Again, it's in that handout. But basically, basically getting, getting students to, to think about um, how does your idea, how does what we're talking about potentially impact some of the most vulnerable pregnant birthing postpartum persons discuss implications for at least one group of persons, um, et cetera. Um, and then I give some examples of vulnerable populations. Um, and this comes right after the, <laughs> don't forget, we're supposed to focus on resilience um, uh, too. So there you go, there's your challenge <laughs> to do both. Any other things people think of when you think about how you might restructure the content of your questions? This one's a little esoteric. Maybe we'll just move on to the next one. Don't, if you think of something as we move on, don't be afraid to, um, to just say it, share it, ch chat it, put it in the poll everywhere if you want to be anonymous. Another potential area for improvement is just, great. oh, go ahead. Really quickly, we just had something come in through the anonymous poll everywhere forum. And this individual saying, says, I think there's a real danger of stereotyping here. And I think that's a really nice cautionary reminder uh, to be thoughtful and when we're talking about all of these different topics. So I just wanted to make sure that that comment got put on the plate here. Really, really important. I'm so grateful that you're saying that. And um, I think that is our role as educators, right? Um, and, um, and maybe you do this as a journal so that your students are traumatizing each other by posting stereotypical things. Um, that's and that can be a problem, right? If you have a an, a discussion or a forum post um, where students are saying really unenlightened things that hurt other students, um, but of course, all your students need to learn, um, and so those are definitely things to think about. Um, I do think, as an instructor, you have to be able to to uh, help students learn if they are stereotyping. Um, my, in my experience, I've, I've used this for two years now. I haven't really come across it in that way. Uh, we do, though, have students in their first quarter um, do a power and privilege course, so I don't know if that helps. Um, I would think that it probably does. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, great, it's a great point. I don't want to minimize it. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, all right. I'll go ahead on to the next section for now. Um, and, and oh, the same thing happens, you know, when we're wanting to do case studies, right? We can really have issues with stereotyping when we're do, trying to do case studies as well. Um, so it's just a great reminder. Um, another area for potential improvement is integrating important concepts. Um, and I will share um, some of those <laughs> here because uh, I, oh, I should share them one by one and then people could come up with them. Um, but uh, as an example, the type of um, concepts that we might want to make sure are integrated into our curricula. Does anyone want to add any important concepts or talk about any of these concepts or something you've learned around them with regard to your own syllabi and curricula and classroom time? So, um, uh, for those on the phone, I'll just read um, some of these. Health equity, social justice, obviously, we're talking about today. Unconscious and implicit bias, microaggressions, disparities and resilience, historical trauma and cultural healing, health literacy, reproductive and birth justice, social determinants of health and structural competency. Tori is sharing an, uh, um, about an IOM report about okay. how to teach social I'm determinants of health. On the web for Oh my gosh, Siri, my phone is thinking I'm asking her to do something. <laughs> Anyone else want to add anything here? Thank you, Tori. I will um, look that up and try to get it on the website if it's not already there. I'm, I'm not sure if it is. Um, hi, this is Cynthia. Um, there's another concept that I've learned a lot about recently, the concept of stereotype threat uh, that I feel like is important to start adding to our lists of important concepts. Um, stereotype threat is a um, phenomena where um, stereotyped groups who are at risk, um, let, me, <laughs> let me find the entry point for this. Um, uh, students and patients um, who are from marginalized and stereotyped groups uh, carry a fear that often is unconscious that they will be um, seen or evaluated through the lens of the negative stereotype. And uh, this causes, causes an unconscious stress response that um, takes up a lot of mental space and um, impairs performance and undermines uh, trust in the relationship. And there's this, um, there are like a thousand studies about study stereotype threat, and um, most of the research is in regards to students in academic settings. Um, but there's also a whole body of research emerging about how we relate to patients. And there are all of these interventions um, that have a lot of research that you can do to remove the stereotype threat. And it bas basically, it greatly improves the academic academic performance and even the health parameters of students of color. Um, and so one of the interventions actually involves teaching students about the phenomenon of stereotype threat and having them do an activity around it and that helps to remove the stereotype threat for students. Such a great example. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Really good one. I need to get more of that on the website. Absolutely. Another uh, in the post here, we have someone just mentioning um, uh, cultural humility. Absolutely. Um, and, and thinking about our uh, what we're trying to do more about cultural as cultural humility, cultural sensitivity, cultural versatility, as opposed to cultural competence. Great point. Um, this is Cynthia. I'm going to jump in again with um, the concept of structural competency being, uh, oh, you've got it on there. Never mind. <laughs> I 
but that's a good one. Probably we can do a whole session on sometime, right? I mean, any of these, uh, all of them, <laughs> more than one session, lifetime of work um, and learning here. But yeah, really great point. Someone on the chat is saying intersectionality. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. I don't know if you want to say any more about it, Nicole, or. Yeah, really good. Well, um, again, since we could have whole sessions on all of these, let's go ahead on to the next section for now. Don't be afraid to add something later. Um, other things, um, highlighting resources. Um, so, um, my, since my baby's awake, I don't even know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> Let me, <laughs> how could you possibly know? Um, oh, just that, Obviously, we can't have our students read everything that is amazing because then it would be more than a two or four credit course, right? Um, so just um, the concept of adding recommended reading sometime if you're not sure about requiring it and maybe you find out that, that it really should be added in the next year. Um, another thing that you can do is have half of the class, you know, like read one thing and half the class read something else. Um, and, you know, um, introduce it to the other students kind of thing, you know, et cetera, those, those, those ways, because sometimes a resource might seem a little tangential, but really we need to be integrating these, Jamie, can you try to have her, um, integrating these, um, all of these concepts, right? Um, and so just thinking about how to do that. Does anyone have any examples of resources, other resources or things that you might um, highlight? All right, let's go ahead and move on. Um, thinking about our methods of evaluation. Does anybody ha have e examples of how we might adapt our methods of, of evaluation to be doing a better job of applying a social justice framework to our curricula and our classrooms? And Courtney, you can feel free to jump in if people are sharing things or if you have things to share. Courtney, of course, is a wealth of resource just in and of herself. So don't be afraid to share, Courtney. <laughs> of course, of course. We just have a couple of uh, comments that are just slow to come in from the last piece. So some more great ideas about uh, resources and concepts and integrating that piece into school here. And then Cynthia is sharing on this topic. Uh, we have to be really aware that our methods of evaluation are part of the structural obstacles. And uh, Cynthia, if you'd like to unmute and tell us more about this, I think you're, you're headed in a really important direction. Well, I don't know that I can be very articulate about it, but I have this growing awareness. Um, for example, um, that students from disadvantaged groups um, are more likely to have um, test-taking anxiety and uh, difficulty uh, showing what they know on standardized tests. And therefore, it's really important, like within my course, I have three exams and three written assignments so that um, student, I can meet students with varying strengths. Um, and if they're not good at one thing, that they have a, a different modality to demonstrate what they know. And that the other thing that's come onto my radar that I've been learning about is universal design for learning. Um, and that's one of the principles of universal design is that you need to give students multiple modalities by which they demonstrate what they know. Really great points. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I'm so glad you're on the call. <laughs> we need to have Cynthia do um, a facilitation for us one of these times. Um, oh, it's not letting me. Let me see what happens. There we go. Um, that's a really great point. Um, the only example I put up here that I learned from um, one of my instructors was adding in anonymous mid-quarter feedback as an option. Um, so having being allowing students to um, to email in and say things that they want changed in the in your course 
um, or that they're struggling with anonymously mid-quarter so that you can even make adjustments um, in that particular quarter? Um, I'm sorry, I may be talking too much. This is Cynthia again. Um, continuing on what I just said, one thing that I've started doing is um, when students make below a certain score on an exam, like if they make below an 80%, uh, I give them an opportunity to do a makeup assignment where um, I give them a document with all of the questions that they missed um, without the right answer. And I have them uh, basically analyze each question about what is the right answer and why did they get it wrong. Um, and I also have them write a little paragraph about their study methods and give them something to read about study methods. So this is a way to support um, those, um, you know, students who have more difficulty with test taking. Thank you. That's re it's really helpful, Cynthia. I'm very grateful you're, you're sharing. And um, we do have a slide coming up about inclusive excellence in assessment which is, you know, one of the fancy kind of words that the, of how people talk about it. And but I'm really grateful you're giving these examples um, because we can also, you know, offer students to be able to turn something back in and you know re revise it and resubmit it as well. And that's a great point. I see some. I don't know stuff in the chat box. If Courtney has any thoughts about it or. Tori's just telling us uh, an example that recently Tori engaged with one of the students. And so Tori, do you want to read your own comment or would you like us to just let it, let it be read? I don't know if Tori has audio, so we'll just let people read that on their own time. And then there's some more from Marilyn and from Cynthia. So so some really important pieces here in the chat box, if anyone wants to reference that. And um, just thinking about as well that, um, you know, what, what we put in our course evaluations, what kind of questions, you know, are we asking if students have experienced um, racism or oppression or marginalization in the classroom, um, those kind of things that we can add into our um, own evaluation. So, there, so there's more than one, way of thinking about evaluation. Um, and there is a page of my website that speaks a little bit to this as well. Yeah, and really quickly, I think Tori, uh, Tori has said that you'd like a response. And so what we're seeing here, so I'm gonna read it out loud to see if anyone would like to respond. Uh, so Tori says, I heard a Pacific Islander speak recently about the importance of teaching, quote, Western educational skills to students who did not grow up with them. His culture does not tell linear stories. I teach topic sentences to my doctoral students over and over. I asked him about this, saying, I don't want to beat the cultural background out of my students. But he was adamant that I prepare them to succeed in the academic world. And then Karen responds, thanks for that, Tori. I struggle with that too. As the chair of graduate students committees and working with students on, quote, academic writing basics, as defined by white culture institutions. And so I think what we're starting to see in this discussion, and I'd love to hear from others, is perhaps a tension between oftentimes uh, the assignments, the work, the evaluation criteria being used in higher education comes from whiteness and white norms. And so then, right, what is it being evaluated on? You're being evaluated on linear sentences, on good structure, on grammar, on syntax, on all these pieces. And in, in Tori's experience or case study here, right, they, the student is saying, no, teach me that I want to know that. And Tori's saying that I don't want to not recognize that that's not the only way to learn or to be or to be assessed. And certainly cross-culturally, we see uh, in, in carrying on your example here, Tori, more not always linear stories being shared. And that's not always a way in the written culture, for instance, there's a great article on characteristics of, of white supremacy and organizations that talks about this utter value of the written word over other forms of being and telling and experiencing. And so what does that mean then, right, for uh, in the classroom and addressing not only different learning styles, but evaluation methods. 
So I'll just add that in here and, and open it up for other discussion that people would like to grapple with uh, as Tori and then Karen weighed in on in some of that tension that may be experienced in the classroom as educators. Really great points. Definitely want to allow people to say more if you want to. I've just switched to this other slide as well because it's related, right, when we're talking about evaluating students and assessing learning. Um, I, I find the Xavier example a really great read if you haven't read this um, article from the New York Times. Um, Does anyone else want to add anything to these topics that we've been covering? So some examples of what you can do, um, you know, not always having students write. Um, you could have synchronous classes and live sessions if you have an online program, um, even if you have a hybrid program. Um, and then uh, uh, this is an example from my own syllabus that I also got from Tanya Kmet. Um, you know, allowing just these other ways of, for students to submit um, in our hybrid program. So I allow up to 50% of a student's post can be voice recordings, um, and then I get to tell them, you know, a length of time. And interestingly, in my small experience, you know, my N of 15 or whatever, <laughs> um, whenever I have offered things like this, um, oh, you can do a video, you can do a podcast, um, you don't have to write. Interestingly, sometimes um, I have found disproportionately that some of my students from marginalized communities choose these options. Um, and it's amazing. I would much rather watch a video sometimes than keep reading everyone's stuff. <laughs> and we have another comment here uh, about somebody who is currently in school and one of the things they're often asked to do for a medium is to create PowerPoint slides with a voiceover answer uh, to the question or assignment. And so I think what uh, the comments in the chat box and what you're sharing here, Kristen, on the screen is pointing to the multiple ways that we can engage in teaching and learning and subsequent assessment. And it doesn't just have to be the written word as kind of the best method or uh, you know, the hierarchical method that is often placed at the top in, in higher education. So some really important points about expanding the ways in which we think about education. Right. And just to be clear about the Xavier example, my very brief interpretation of what that, part of what's in that article is just, Assessing students early and often, but not necessarily with a penalty attached so that you can help them get to where they need to be um, give the, you know, attach them to the resources. Um, giving study guides as needed, um, which we've already heard a little bit about today. Um, and as we know, this is structurally because of students coming from underperforming um, secondary educational system, um, which is a direct result of institutional racism that persists Was someone trying to unmute yourself. There. And add something. We have someone posting visuals and graphics should be as valued um, as text. Great points. Yeah, thanks everyone for sharing. Um, universal design for learning, great. I'm gonna try to go back here just to, for what we skipped. Um, oh, look at that, the next one. Addressing all learning styles. <laughs> Very good. We're, they're all connected, of course. Um, and so as people have said, um, including audiovisual resources, um, you know, in my midwifery, my introduction to midwifery class, I added some poetry, art, and song. Some students hate that and others are like, thank you so much. <laughs> um, they, remembering small group work is important to some people. Anything anyone want to add here about learning styles, a particular example that you found really powerful? Um, an activity that you think you're really glad you discovered. Okay, since we, we don't have uh, all day, we'll just go on to the next. Um, allowing for diversity of expression and reactions. Um, and again, this is a little bit of some of what we've been talking about, giving people choices to videotape a role play. Um, Sometimes you can allow students to pick a project or their assignment topics with some guidance, of course. I already talked a little bit about the, um, 
the syllabus statements that you might add into your own syllabus. One thing I did recently with, um, I have the students read The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, um, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend. Um, but because I, you know, I've been teaching it for years and um, uh, the first year that I had two students um, whose parents were refugees, I learned a lot. Unfortunately, they had to, um, really unfortunately, they had to teach me some stuff. Um, I don't think it was horrible, but it was hard. And so I, um, you know, I moved, there's three different times in the course where they, the students post things about what they're learning. Um, and I moved that, that first section in week four, I moved it into a private journal because some of the students were traumatizing the other students in their learning process. Um, and then I also um, just added in this disclaimer that if someone finds this book really triggering and they're just having undue stress from reading this book every week of this course, I'm willing to, to figure something else out for them. Um, and I don't know if either of them would have taken that option, but um, I was, um, I just thought I need to put this in there. Um, so anyway, that was something I learned. Um, yeah, that's, that's so important. And, and another thing just came through on our anonymous poll, so I will read it out loud. And someone said regarding uh, more additional learning styles, gamification, so using games and activities that require movement, for instance. And so that is another comment that they put in. And I would add to that, uh, that we want to think through, right, differential abilities in terms of activities that require movement and thinking about how we can also replicate games and activities in different forms of education, be it brick and mortar or hybrid or distance learning. Uh, and yet that piece of games and activities, interactivities can be really important for learning for different styles. Great points. Anything, anyone else in this section? And again, don't, don't be afraid to add it in as we move on. Um, we already kind of looked at this page. Um, so a big important one, noticing who is given expert status in your classes. Um, anyone want to talk a little bit about this, some learning you've had around it or? So these are some questions you can ask yourself, um, really digging in to, to identify who have you set up as the experts in the topics you teach? Who's written the materials um, you require students to read? Are they all white, mostly white? Um, and if there really are no other options, you can say that, um, but it's important to acknowledge. Um, and this can be really huge, bring in, in guest speakers to balance perspectives. Um, Cynthia is saying, um, making sure to have um, people of color as guest lecturers, panels, assigning readings from um, people of color. Yeah, and Nicole Morales had said this uh, earlier as well, preempting this slide, I think, again, showing the importance of looking, Nicole's comment was around integrating resources uh, by LGBTQ and people of color. And I think, again, we're seeing how interrelated all of these topics are as we preempt some of the ways you're going through these slides, Kristen. So it's a nice point of articulation between it all. Thank you. Yeah, it is just really my brain. <laughs> so, <it's not laughs> um, so I appreciate, yeah, all the, the, the thoughts. Great. Um, and we can say more about that, I'm sure. So if anyone has anything more they want to share, don't be afraid. Um, oh, Tori's saying, thinking about how you're referring to one another, Dr. Mr. Miss. Very good. And some of the, one of the things um, we kind of laughed about it because it was like this resource clearly directed at like the engineering department, you know, at Penn State University. Um, but really it's true for all of us. I, we laughed because we were a, a room of mostly um, people who identify as cis females um, thinking about, you know, um, cis males not getting it um, sometimes. Um, and the resource says, you know, if you're going to call the men in your class by first and last name, then you want to make sure you do that same thing for the women. Um, and we laugh because if we don't laugh, we'll cry, right? Um, but um, obviously, the, the, the reality in engineering is very stark and clear um, in terms of the numbers um, and who, who gets to succeed 
Um, and uh, I bring it up because um, I'm losing my train of thought. Oh, because, because what we're talking about there, what we're trying to get at is those implicit biases that we all have. And um, it's, it's something as a white educator, I sometimes feel myself, my implicit biases rising up from deep within me. Um, and, uh, and I just need to keep working on it. Um, you know, making sure that we aren't calling our, you know, white students one way and our, um, you know, students of color a different way. Just it's very subtle, but it's a microaggression and it's not okay. Um, yeah, and absolutely. And, and Nicole's adding in another layer to this as we think through how we speak to people and about people and what me materials we use. Nicole also added looking at history. So Nicole says, where did Ina May get the Gaskin maneuver? Where did the roots of osteopathy come from? Some experts, right, experts that are identified as experts, uh, got these concepts from others and didn't attribute the sourcing. And I think that's such an important point when we consider how the current landscape is very much shaped by those historical injustices and how they're continued on, right? And what that looks like. So, so really important pieces here being brought in from Nicole. Uh, and then some additional comments on naming and titling for people. Really great, thank you. Um, again, this is related to what we talked about before, but just, just remembering to always be considering the implications for um, vulnerable, marginalized, and resilient populations. Um, I just put some of them here because we wanna be trying to think about um, uh, people from these groups um, in variety of, of places in our curriculum, um, in our curricula and just, where where can and should these um the lives of the lived experience of people who are from these communities be brought in whether it's a case study um and um of course there are more so i don't know if anyone wants to add anything to this group um this listing um, And of course, trying to avoid stereotyping. Yes, as we've already talked about. So just so much work to be done. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead to the next section. Um, mapping student de demographics. Um, and the reason um, I bring that up is so that, um, you know, our, our syllabi are never going to be perfect. Our courses are never going to be perfect. Of course, it's life, lifetime learning. It's what we're talking about. Um, if you can map your student demographics as, um, ahead of time, you might be able to help fix some stuff <laughs> in your courses. Um, and so one example that um, I had to do, again, in, in my healthcare policies and health systems course was, oh yeah, I, ha I include Canada um, because we've had Canadian students, but I had never had a student from Puerto Rico. And so I had to go through and whenever I was telling students they could choose a topic, I always, uh, you know, I would say, from the US, from Canada, or from some other country, you know, they had that choice. And, but I didn't talk about the US colonies, the territories. Um, and so I, you know, made sure that anywhere in my syllabus that I give students a choice of, that I added in territories to remind all of our students that we still do have um, colonies um, and um, it's not okay. Um, so there are places. Um, for recognizing who's in your class and um, figuring out what you can do to, to make your curriculum better. With regard to religious minorities, um, uh, allowing exemptions for people to not have to turn in work um, during a religious holiday, um, acknowledging that most, if not all of our schedules, our school schedules are um, Christian based, Christian holiday based. And figuring out what we're going to do about it and when it can't change, acknowledging it. Anyone want to add anything here? Okay. 
we're, we're low on time, so I am going to just move forward. Um, I have some department and school wide suggestions here that um, you can read. Um, the equity agenda guideline um, on my website um, was really designed to be that as well. Um, a way for, you know, if you don't already sit down as a change team, as an equity committee, um, somewhere to think about how do we get started um, doing that work. Oh, there's the religious holiday thing. Um, does anybody want to add anything here? Um, I probably don't have time to read through these, um, but so one of my favorite ones um, in here is considering the possibility of paying a stipend to have advisors help faculty review their curriculum because we as white folks can do what we can do if we're white um, or if we're from, you know, if we have a lot of unearned advantages in other areas, um, whether that's, you know, being cis female, et cetera. Um, we really um, can't do it all on our own. We shouldn't try. Um, we should keep <laughs> working on it, um, but we shouldn't try to do it on our own. Um, Anything anyone wants to add here before we kind of? Um, move on to the next section. Yeah, okay. Again, we've already kind of talked a lot about resources. Um, there you go. <laughs> There's some more. <laughs> Making sure we're thinking about climate and the hidden curriculum. Um, trying to help our students develop critical consciousness, always and everywhere thinking about power and privilege and making sure our, all of our faculty are doing that, our, um, our students are hopefully learning how to do that. Um, thanks for being here today. Um, let's see what is next. Oh, we don't have time for small groups, but um, this is something you could do with your own um, colleagues, um, is to, to do small groups around this stuff. Um, and um, brainstorming and then coming back together, sharing those insights with a larger group like we have done today. Um, and um, I just love tulips and we have a tulip festival out here in Washington, pretty much. I think it's happening right now or very soon. Um, and uh, I just think that's how it should be. Not like that little poor dandelion um, over there. Um, just final reflections, just, for me, I have to have a way of go when I go, when I walk through the world, how do I make notes about things I want to change in my courses? Um, so I use, I have a Google document app on my phone that I use, and that way I can always just like write things down when I'm thinking about them, because otherwise I won't remember when I sit down at the beginning of the quarter, which is the end of the last quarter, <laughs> all the things I want to fix. Um, and even just a notepad in your phone um, can be really great. Um, oh, and Cynthia is saying troll is a great tool for managing tasks and ideas. Thank you for sharing. Cynthia. Is that like troll.com or something? Whoops, actually not troll, Trello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> T-R-E-L-L-O. Thanks. <laughs> any, any other, anything anybody else wants to share in that um, regard? Um, and feel free, again, if there's anything that, that you want to share, Courtney, is there anything you want to pull in before I kind of move to the kind of the end? No, some, some good comments here in the chat box for everybody to look at. And then uh, we'll want to repost the equity agenda guideline for midwifery education and training programs that you referenced because the current doc link is down. So we're going to need to fix that and get it out to people. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I'll fix that. And um, I'll put it on that Padlet site too. I, I don't think I already did that, but I will. Um, sure. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Um, just a suggested activity that you can do for yourself. You can do it if you're an administrator, you can do it with all your faculty. Um, but, um, you know, as we think about kind of signing off here today, just um, making a commitment to yourself, and I say from your best self, what will you help, um, what will you do to help infuse equity and social justice into your curriculum and classroom in the next one month, three months, and nine months? 
be specific and realistic and choose at least one thing to do for each time period. Um, so some ideas here, you can say, I will read something, I will watch a webinar, I will meet with a colleague to share ideas and learn together. Um, and really, I'm not asking you to do all of these things, I'm asking you to choose something that is um, realistic that you will actually do. Um, one month being because it's soon, um, three months being because it might, some of you might be on quarters, um, and nine months being because if you're not on, um, you know, if you only teach one time a year, then you might be getting ready for your next, um, you know, year of, of teaching um, in nine months. So, um, yeah. Any other ideas that people want to add here for things you might do to, to do that lifelong learning? I like this picture down at the bottom right um, for, as a white woman. Um, I, I was, you know, want to think about the tools. What can I do to help the soil be more rich? Um, and, uh, but I can't and shouldn't, of course, try to do it on my own. Um, but I like that picture anyway. All right. Um, and then um, just kind of saying thank you so much um, for your participation. Um, oh, here's two. I'm realizing something else I forgot to draw in. Um, just two about what's coming up. Um, again, our next webinar, Thursday, April 5th, same time, um, similar channel on Zoom. Um, we, have, we will have the great pleasure of Dr. Keisha Good um, giving us a follow-up on her dissertation, Birth, Birthing Blackness and the Body, Black Midwives and Experiential Continuities of Institutional Racism. So um, that will be um, one that you can get CEUs for. Um, and then as I said, um, this is the place to look for the next call and it, um, the date of that will be that Wednesday, June 6th at the same time. Um, so those are um, everything other than just really thank you again, Courtney, for your behind the scenes work to help make this call run smoothly. Um, and otherwise, um, thank you all. I'll update that equity agenda guideline. Let me do show you this um, since we do have one minute, if my computer is gonna work. <laughs> Are you gonna work computer or are you getting tired and overwhelmed? Let's, let's try, there we go. So on, um, from the website, um, the, way, the, the equity agenda guideline is actually all over the place, um, but you can go from the home page, and if you go how to use these resources, um, that's where I will update this link, which is the one that's broken, apparently. <laughs> um, Although it's not broken on mine, so actually that does work. So there's one where one place where you can get it if you want to get it right now while you're thinking about it. Um, and otherwise, um, I will make sure that that gets put in the emails. If you're not signed up through Mailchimp, that's how um, I will send a follow-up email. So you can from the website you can go and get signed up on that email list um, if you'd like to get a follow-up email and get information about future stuff that's happening. Great. And can you also go back uh, as we end here in just a minute for to your small group page? Uh, somebody, a participant would like a screenshot of that. Yes. And you do have, uh, which one? This one? I don't know. It's, it's anonymous. Whatever one was your small group page. Small group. Okay. That's not this, I don't think. Hang on. Oh, this one. Yes. Okay. I believe that would be correct. <laughs> Let me know if it's not. And you have all these slides from the Padlet um, site. Maybe, Courtney, if you, if you feel like you can find that Padlet link. Um, all these slides, it's a PDF that um, I gave you this PDF of these slides. So, and you can come up with more and change them, obviously. Um, yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, Really, really, I think this was amazing. I hope um, you thought so too. I learned a lot. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you everyone for participating. Very robust call today. I'll go ahead and just end the meeting for all. Um, thanks again, everyone.
Oh, maybe I'll wait actually until a minute in case people are still copying and pasting. <laughs> Okay. All right. Signing off. <laughs>